get rid of them. Oh. Ye gods! With Mrs. Barker Finch watching, this is all I need. You know I love my family, but that's no reason why I should have to acknowledge them in broad daylight. <laughs> May I help you people? <laughs> you people? If they're family, why is Harsinth acting as if they're strangers? That's the impression she likes to give. We humans are social animals, and conformity is hardwired into our brains by evolution. This might have helped our ancestors survive, but in the modern world, this need to keep up appearances is getting us into trouble. Envy is at the core of it and cannot be separated from our need to conform. It is messing up our personal finances and making us miserable at the same time. Learning to control this need for conformity is the most important personal finance and happiness skill you can learn. Humans are social animals. We live in a society with others and conformity is hardwired into our brains. This hardwiring served us well for a long time. Forming alliances and learning to cooperate with others in a small group is how our ancestors survived harsh environments with powerful predators who are much bigger than us. But in the modern world, this hardwiring manifests as need to keep up appearances. We want to fit in with our neighbors and appear normal so that others will accept us. If it's not your neighbors, then it's your friends, family, or whomever you compare yourself with. It can be deeply uncomfortable when it's clear that we don't fit it. To stand out in undesirable ways and to fall behind is a scary thought. We feel it viscerally. This need to keep up appearances can be almost pathological in some people, but none of us is totally immune to it. We project an aura of success and happiness and show in subtle ways that we got our lives together. Initially, we might just spin our current situation to make it look more impressive than it is. But over time, we get sucked into it more and more. We begin buying fancier cars, bigger houses, branded clothes and accessories just for appearance. Slowly, how things seem becomes more important than how things actually are. There are two problems with this. First, it messes up our personal finances when we spend more than we can afford to buy things we don't need to impress people we don't know or don't like. And second, this way of thinking and acting makes us deeply unhappy. Americans often remember 1950s as the golden age of middle class prosperity. According to the economist Yuga Pohl, the decade of the 20th century Americans would most like to go back to is 1950s. This is true particularly for those who identify as Republicans, but a lot of Democrats also feel this way. It is also the most popular decade among women too, even though 1950s were an age of stay-at-home wives. The median American family in the 1950s had three kids and a dog and a breadwinning husband who typically worked at the factory. Why do Americans like the 1950s, even though they are more prosperous and secure now by any metric you can imagine? Family income adjusted for inflation was $29,000 in 1955. In 2018, it was $63,000. Median hourly wages adjusted for inflation are nearly 50% higher today than they were in 1955. Healthcare costs have indeed exploded in the past 20 years, and currently 8% of Americans don't have health insurance. But over half of Americans didn't have health insurance in 1950. That partly explains why 4% of Americans didn't live to see their 50th birthday in 1950, versus less than 1% today. Yes, half of Americans don't have enough retirement savings today. But in the 1950s, the entire concept of retirement was a luxury reserved only for the upper classes. Poverty among those over 65 was nearly 30%, compared to less than 10% today. The home ownership rate was 12 percentage points lower in 1955 than it is today. An average home was a third smaller than today, despite having more occupants. Those who yearn for the 1950s are not wrong. Though America has objectively become more prosperous and secure in the last 70 years, people don't feel good about it because their expectations grew faster than their prosperity. John Rockefeller, the richest individual in America's business and economic history after adjusting for inflation, never had Advil, Pencilin, Netflix, air conditioning or jet planes. But nobody today wakes up feeling better off than Rockefeller because that's not how people think. 
subconsciously or not everyone looks around and says what do other people like me have what do they do because that's what i should have and that's what i should do as well in the age of social media such a comparison is very hard to avoid even if you want to this is the reason why you have people like gary creamen who founded match.com he was worth 10 million dollars at 43 but he felt like a nobody in silicon valley even though his net worth puts him in the top half of 1% in america and probably the top 1000th of 1% in the world he felt like a nobody and logged 60 to 80 hour work weeks because in silicon valley he is surrounded by many people who are worth a lot more than him people have tried to escape this misery trap the fire moment which stands for financial independence and retire early is one way out many people in their 20s 30s and 40s are rejecting the notion that income earning must be the most dominant activity of their adult lives and that the reward of retirement must wait until they get old their solution is to live frugally save intensely and retire in the prime of their life it is very popular there are currently more than 700000 members in the fire subreddit popular blog and podcast network choose fi has registered more than 1.6 million downloads to date another fire related blog mr money mustache reported last year that it has been accessed by more than 30 million unique visitors since 2011 at its spiritual core overcoming the need for conforming is what the fire movement is about they choose to do things differently and make choices that go against the mainstream cars for them are not a status symbol they are only a means of transport they save their money by driving their cars for a longer period and commute by bikes and public transportation they recognize that housing is the single largest expense for most families and choose less expensive and smaller homes they sacrifice present comfort for future security by saving 30 50 or even 70% of their income instead of the standard 8% they don't spend money to keep up with the joneses or the sharmas if you're watching from india they spend only to support their personal goals they aren't interested in what other people buy or do at least that's the theory even if it's very hard in practice but the fire movement does not address the fundamental cause of our misery the solution is to recognize that we all do it understand why it happens and practice a different way of thinking in skillful ways that is the most important personal finance skill you can possibly have the need to keep up appearances is inseparable from shorten fraud the pleasure you experience when others experience misfortune to avoid this trap you first need to be honest with yourself and accept that you experience it sometimes strong enough to act on like all of us you might only be conscious of the indignation or resentment you feel which covers up the initial pangs of envy but this is envy plain and simple and there is nothing to be ashamed of it is just human nature we all compare ourselves with others we all feel unsettled by those who are superior in some area that we see and we all react to this by feeling some form of envy the most common trigger is a sudden change in status which alters your relationship to friends and peers this is particularly true among people in your own profession even someone so talented and celebrated as michelangelo the 15th century italian painter during the renaissance who painted the ceiling of the sistine chapel clearly envied the younger and the talented raphael and did what he could to sully his reputation and block his commissions it is wired into our nature studies have shown that monkeys feel envy as an experiment next time you hear or read about the sudden success of someone in your field notice the inevitable feeling of wanting the same thing the pants and the subsequent hostility however vague towards the person you envy it's almost impossible to rid ourselves of the compulsion to compare ourselves with others instead what we must aspire to is to slowly transform our comparing inclination into something positive productive and pro social there are six simple exercises you can do that will help you achieve this robert green talks about this in his excellent book loss of nature envy thrives in relative closeness in a corporate environment where people see each other every day in a family in a neighborhood or in any group of peers but people tend to hide their problems and put their best faces forward 
we only see and hear of their triumphs, their new relationships, their brilliant ideas that will land them a gold mine. Elon Musk is worth over $270 billion. He owns a lot of super luxury houses and has dated many women. It is easy to envy him from a distance. I'm glad he exists and I'm grateful for what he is doing for humanity. But you need to take a closer look at his lifestyle and then decide if you want his life or not. He works for 90 to 100 hours every week and often sleeps in his factories. And he got divorced three times. You might envy your friend's exciting vacation pictures on Instagram, but you don't see the quarrels that go on behind closed doors. You might envy your friend for getting a job at Goldman Sachs or McKinsey, but can you work for 80 to 90 hours a week and not get back to home before 1 a.m. on a Saturday night? You don't know about the horrible bosses they have to put up with, otherwise you would have less reason to feel it. Nothing is ever so perfect as it seems. And often, we would see that we are mistaken if we only looked closely enough. If you envy celebrities with greater fame and attention, know that such attention comes with a lot of hostility and scrutiny. That is quite painful. Wealthy people are often miserable. Check out my recent video about the Vanderbilts and you'll see that great wealth brought them endless nightmares including the most spoiled and unloving of children. When you take a closer look, you're not diminishing the achievements of great people. You're only looking behind the glittering facades people present and actively think about the disadvantages that come with their positions. Be inspired by them, but don't envy them. When you do that, your tendency to move your goalposts and spend money just to keep up appearances will soften. Envy the freedom to pursue their passions that wealth brings, not the expensive cars and houses it affords. The best antidote to envy is gratitude. For me personally, writing down all the positives in my life and counting all my blessings has been very helpful. This includes the good health I enjoy, the people in my life who have been kind to me, and the countries I was born in and I currently live in. Gratitude is a muscle that requires to be worked out continually, otherwise it'll atrophy. We take our good fortune for granted normally. There are many people who have less than you, even among your own friends and family. They live in harsher environments and deal with more threats to their lives, suffer from worse health, and have deeper levels of insecurity about the future. This should stimulate not only greater empathy for the many who have less, but also greater gratitude for what you actually possess. If respect and admiration are your goals, be careful how you seek it. Humility, kindness and empathy will bring you more respect than the expensive things you own ever will. Try this exercise. The next time you hear about someone's good fortune or success, don't just congratulate them and forget about it. Instead, try to empathize with them and try to actually feel their joy and excitement. It's almost as if you're curious about how good it feels and satisfying it with your empathy and imagination. It's their turn to experience joy now, but it could be years next. If it can happen to them, then it can happen to you too. I understand this is unnatural and our initial tendency is to feel a pang of envy. But we can train ourselves to imagine how it must feel to others to experience their happiness or satisfaction. This is what philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche called mid-Freud, joying with, the opposite of schadenfreude. He further wrote, the serpent that stings us means to hurt us and rejoices as it does so. The lowest animal can imagine the pain of others. But to imagine the joy of others and rejoice it is the highest privilege of the highest animals. The mid-Freud exercise will not only clear our brains of ugly envy, but it greatly helps us connect with other people. Because it is such a rare occurrence, it contains great power to bond with people. This is the very opposite of schadenfreude, like I said. Several studies have shown that schadenfreude is distinctly related to envy. When we envy someone, we are prone to great excitement, even joy, if they experience a setback or suffer. Since we cannot stop comparing ourselves to others, it's best to work with this tendency but direct it towards something positive. Transmute the pangs of envy into a desire to improve yourself and raise yourself to the other person's level. They are probably at a higher skill level than you. Instead of wanting to hurt or steal from those who make us envious, let it stimulate your competitive juices. To do this, you first have to believe in your own ability. 
the confidence that you can improve yourself is a great antidote to envy. Don't just wish to possess what the other person has. Figure out how they got it and work hard. Besides confidence, you also need discipline and persistence. Lazy people are more envious. A solid work ethic that allows you to persist with your efforts over a long period of time is necessary. Slow burning motivation is much more powerful than a sudden flash of inspiration. Having a sense of purpose and realizing what your calling in life is will help you get over envy. It is realizing your potential that gives you true happiness and satisfaction, not the attention you get when you succeed. The other merit of this yardstick is that your sense of self-worth comes from within, not from without. Admiration is as far away from envy as it can be. When you admire someone, you accept their superiority in their line of work and you celebrate their achievements without feeling insecure. It is about experiencing Mitfreud, like I said earlier, with the highest potential of human species. This frees us from our pettiness and gives us peace of mind. We often find it easier to admire the dead, but it is important that we admire the living as well. That will drive us to improve ourselves and emulate them as much as we can. Have you ever seen one of those videos that shows how small our Earth is on the scale of our solar system? let alone the Milky Way galaxy or the entire universe. All of us live on a small blue dot, like Carl Sagan said. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being, whoever was, lived our lives there. Such contemplations are sublime. You also experience such intense therapeutic moments when you're in beautiful landscapes like forests, lakes, seas, or mountains. You don't need success, achievement, or nice things to experience happiness. Spiritual traditions, especially Eastern ones, say happiness comes from within, not without. Even if you are not into spirituality, you can cultivate moments of immense unconditional satisfaction and happiness. Such moments will also greatly help in taking away your pettiness and the ugliness of envy. If you've liked this video, I recommend that you watch this one. That video is about why having an internal scorecard is essential for your personal finances and why seeking external validation can hurt you. I'm Sharat Mantravadi. Thanks for watching.